All right, so we're going to finish up the remainder of the term talking about polymers and a little bit of biochemistry. But let's first describe what a polymer is. A polymer is something that is made up of many parts. Another way of thinking of it, it is a repeating chain of monomers. Commonly, polymers are referred to as plastics. So most of the plastics you see in your day-to-day -day life are polymers. However, there's a lot of polymers that are non-plastic materials. So a good example of that would be a protein. is actually a, a long polymer that's kind of been balled up into a unique shape. So polymers are pretty important both in our day-to-day -day lives and in biology. But let's take a look at some of the simplest polymers first. And one simple one we can look at is with an alkene. What do you think the prefix is going to be for this alkene? It's two carbons long. What's the prefix for two carbons? F. F, exactly. So F is for two carbons. So people will call this ethene to indicate that it's two carbons. Or most people will just call this ethylene. Ethylene is usually the more common name for this monomer. Um, this is derived primarily from natural gas. So when you do uh, natural gas drilling, you uh, collect a lot of uh, hydrocarbons, one of which uh, can be turned into ethylene pretty easily. This is going to be our monomer, meaning it's going to be our individual building block. Specifically, too, this has a double bond in it. And when we polymerize this or turn it into a long chain, what we're going to do is eliminate that double bond and turn it into a big single bond chain. So I'll show you an example of this. We'll do a big long chain of carbons. And then to indicate that this can go on forever, what we do is we bracket it. And then we put some sort of symbol down here, sometimes N, to indicate that this could be any number of units. In addition, all of the hydrogens that were on the monomer are still there. Not really. It can be any repeating number of units. So actually, look, I'm going to slide this over one more just so we can keep track of things a bit better. So for example, we could say this was one monomer unit, right? This and green was another monomer unit. And then in orange over here, we've got another monomer. So this would be three monomers that were all linked together. Does that make sense? The big difference with this is we went from having all double bonds between carbons to exclusively single bonds. If you notice, though, each monomer had four hydrogens. And in our polymer, we still had those four hydrogens coming off of each of the individual monomers. All we did was change the double bonds to single bonds, and we linked them all together. Yep? There are some, and we'll talk about that. Those are usually uh, referred to as condensation polymers. This is referred to as an addition polymer. It's a good question. What do you think this polymer might be called if the monomer is ethylene? Anybody know? Polyethylene. Polyethylene. Exactly. <laughs> so polyethylene just means you've got many ethylene units linked together into this long polymer chain. Does anybody know what polyethylene is used in? I see a few water bottles floating around the room, like that smart water bottle there. That's actually made of polyethylene. Polyethylene is one of the uh, most used plastics uh, on our planet. We use a lot of polyethylene because it's cheap to make, it's durable, it's rugged, it can be recycled easily. It's actually fairly environmentally friendly as long as it's recycled. All right, so let's take a look at this in a bit more detail. 
If you look at these chains, they're not perfectly straight. They actually kind of um, zigzag a little bit. Why is that? Does anybody know? Think about the geometry for each of these carbon atoms. What's the geometry? Tetrahedral, right? It's got four different atoms attached to it. And because of that, we'd never get these perfect straight chains. They actually zigzag slightly due to that tetrahedral uh, geometry for every single carbon. The cool thing with polymers is theoretically this can go on forever. And in addition to this, you can perform additional reactions to allow for branching. You can imagine if you've got a long chain and you start introducing branches to it, it's going to change the property of that polymer a lot. So properties can be changed pretty easily. Specifically, they can change by two main things. One is the length or mass of the polymer. That can definitely change the properties of the polymer itself. The other thing that can change it is the branching. If you have very little branching, the plastics tend to be very brittle and rigid. If you have a lot of branching, they tend to be softer and more flexible. So they can really change the property of these plastics. So I did want to show you two of the most common plastics that we see in our day-to-day -day life, and then we'll take a look at some different ones in a minute. The first one is referred to as HDPE. And an easy way of spotting this is if you look on the bottom of your bottles, you might see that recycling symbol with a two in it. <coughs> This is high density polyethylene. And you can tell by the name that it's got to have a high density. In order for it to have high density, it means it can't have much branching. So it has little branching. That means it packs tightly. And that results in it being rigid. And like I said, this is found in water bottles. You typically don't want a water bottle that's too soft or else it won't hold its shape. Um, it won't be as durable. So water bottles are a common example. Plastic bags are another common example. So if you go to the Safeway down the street, for example, and get a plastic bag that's normally made of high-density polyethylene. There's also a variant of this called LDPE. And this has the recycling symbol 4. And this is low-density polyethylene. So this is another common commercial plastic. This is mostly branched, or highly branched. That means that it loosely packs. And that results in this being a softer plastic. A good example of this would be something like a bike water bottle. So you know the standard bike water bottles or athletic water bottles, they're easy to squeeze and squirt water out of. That's low density polyethylene. So they have different uses and purposes, but they're both produced in a huge amount. There are some environmental and health concerns with plastics, so I wanted to briefly talk about those. And 
a lot of these have actually been talked about in the media and in our local community a fair amount. Does anybody know one of the major health concerns with plastics, specifically water bottles? What's that? Close. Yeah, so there's a concern that maybe some of the chemicals inside the plastic are leaching out and causing health problems, right? How many of you have heard of BPA? So a lot of water bottles lately are listed as BPA free. So BPA is a plasticizer. It helps make the plastic easier to form into a specific shape. And they can leach out into the water and disrupt normal hormone production. The medical term for this is these are endocrine disruptors. So there is a fairly reasonable concern that this will have lasting problems, especially for young kids. Um, that's why more and more bo water bottles are being made of stainless steel or just BPA-free plastic to avoid any potential problems with this. Most medical studies say that in order for this to have any sort of immediate uh, health impact, you have to have a lot of BPA in your system. Most consumers aren't being exposed to enough for it to cause any health problems, but still, most health professionals say it's better to stay away from it if possible. Yep. Are there consumers that really love plastic, like the aluminum cans? Mm -hmm. I've heard that like, people can use them as aluminum, like the deodorant, because it's like, super free system, but we can't get an aluminum can. So it depends, right? Because a, a metal like aluminum is different than a cation, which might be found in a, a household product. Um, so aluminum is very safe as a metal. There is some concerns with aluminum as a cation in consumer products, but there isn't really enough evidence yeah. to show that it's harmful. Yeah. It's more just people are a little wary of it. Yeah. A plant-based plastic? That's a good question. So um, that kind of leads into the next one, which is talking about environmental problems. <laughs> nice segue. What's the big environmental problem with plastics? This has been all over the news lately. Anybody hear about the whale that they found in Europe? Oh, yeah. yeah, I think it had 70 pounds of plastic in its stomach and it ended up dying. The main problem with plastics is they do not decompose. In fact, there's a big concern that microplastics meaning in the ocean plastics get in there, they get broken into tinier and tinier pieces, are radically impacting our ecosystems because small animals are eating them, the small animals are eaten by bigger animals, and so on and so on. And you can bioaccumulate a lot of these plastics. Not very good for an ecosystem. So that's one big concern. The benefit of plant-based plastics um, is that they do decompose. So if you've ever been to maybe some of the catering events on campus, they might have these plastic forks that don't feel like normal plastic. They feel a little softer. Those are made from starches, from potatoes and corn. Um, and they can actually pol polymerize those into biodegradable plastics. One thing a lot of people don't know about those plant-based plastics is you can't just put them in your um, backyard and expect them to decompose. They actually need to be um, recycled still in a commercial facility. It's just a lot easier to decompose them. They don't um, persist in the environment for as long. Yep. But if you leave something like, find a water bottle out in the yard or whatever, just, it's been out in the sun for a while, it starts to seal flimsy and things like that. Is that what you're talking about? Is Not quite. So if you have a normal, let's say, high-density polyethylene water bottle and it's been outside for a long time, it will get brittle. That has mostly to do with the fact that it's been exposed to UV from the sun, and that can break down some of the bonds. But that basically just results in the plastic breaking into smaller chunks, not disappearing altogether. So it's not necessarily a good thing to just leave plastic around. Well, I was just saying. Yeah. Sometimes you go out there like you're cleaning up and you find, yep. hey, my water bottle like, cracked. 
Yeah, it's a big problem, especially the microplastics. If you get a chance, I think um, I think it was Oceans too or Blue Planet. Has anybody heard of Blue Planet? It was on this Discovery Channel. David Attenborough had a whole segment talking about the plastics problems. Uh, it's affecting our oceans really badly. Uh, does anybody know the other big environmental problem with plastics besides just the garbage side? How do we make plastics? Oil, oil and natural gas. So most monomers come from oil or natural gas, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but we do have to be pretty careful with how we uh, drill for oil and natural gas because quite obviously, as we saw in the Gulf of Mexico, things can go wrong. So it's not the most environmentally friendly process. I couldn't help but laugh a few years ago. Um, does anybody remember this? This was out in Ellie Bay in Seattle. Uh, but it was one of the big oil rigs that they were actually going to take up to Alaska to drill for oil in Alaska. And I, the reason I was laughing was everybody's out here in these kayaks, and the kayaks are made of plastic. Plastic's made from oil, and then I just like kind of did a face palm and was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> if you're going to go out there to protest, you should do it in like a wooden canoe. Uh, otherwise, you're really not proving your point. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's good to be aware that plastics do come from oil. Um, a lot of people are really against oil drilling. Uh, my favorite quote from one of my old advisors was, I'm not against oil drilling, I just think it's silly to burn it. We need petroleum products for a lot of these consumer products, but burning it probably isn't the best use of resources. So that's just my personal soapboxing right there. <laughs> All right, so I did want to show you a bunch of addition polymers. And they all follow the same trend. I'm just going to leave this up here. You're welcome to jot these down if you want. But like I said, with addition polymers, what you're doing is you're converting a CC double bond into a big, long chain of CC single bonds. But all of the substituents coming off of your monomer still stay off that polymer, right? So the first one we looked at was a monomer of ethylene, where we had a double bond. And when we link this together, like I said before, you could have one unit of ethylene here in red, and then your second unit of ethylene there in green, and each of those units still has four hydrogens coming off of it, right? And so we're forming one long continuous chain, and we end up calling that polyethylene. If we look at the next one, the monomer is called propylene. Why is that? three carbons, right? So the naming system is pretty important, right? So propylene means we have three carbons in our monomer. And in this case, if you look at it, right, just like with ethylene, you've got this monomer here, you see how we still have the CH3 unit coming off of it, and then the remaining three hydrogens. And then with our next monomer, after we link it over here, we still have that CH3 coming off, and then three remaining hydrogens. So you can continue this on theoretically forever. Polypropylene is commonly found in carpets and synthetic clothing. So if you have non-cotton clothing, chances are there's some polypropylene in there. Does anybody know why polypropylene is really good for uh, hiking and backpacking and outdoor stuff compared to cotton? What's that? It can be waterproof under certain circumstances, but what happens with cotton when you get wet? It's heavy and you get really cold, right? So if you're backpacking and it's raining, cotton is like the worst thing you can possibly wear. Polypropylene and wool, on the other hand, can keep you warm when you're wet. So it's commonly found in outdoors clothing because of that. So you can see the similarity between ethylene and polypropylene. The only difference is we swapped out one of the hydrogens for a CH3 or a methyl group coming off of it. The next one also has some environmental concerns. This is called tetrafluoroethylene. So all of the hydrogens from ethylene has been replaced with fluorines. So you can see we've got a monomer here in red that's been linked with this monomer here in green. And then we have four hydrogens coming off of each of them, right? So this is called polytetrafluoroethylene, PTFE is the acronym, or the brand name is Teflon. What's Teflon used in? Cooking stuff, right? So commonly, pots and pans will be coated in Teflon. Why is that? It's 
non-stick, right? It's really good at keeping food from sticking to your pans. They're easier to clean. However, there is a fair amount of concern with Teflon and the production of Teflon. Um, one thing you might not know about your Teflon pans is it says very clearly on the box, do not use oil at high temperature because it will actually start to decompose the Teflon and you don't want to eat Teflon chips. Um, another thing too is Teflon just tends to flake off over time anyways, even if you use it um, responsibly. Teflon uh, persists in the environment. There's not a good way of getting rid of it. Um, uh, Organic compounds, meaning a carbon-containing compound that has fluorine on it, just persists in the environment and will not go away. It's another big problem for those of you that are into skiing. There's a bunch of waxes that are perfluorinated waxes, um, and those are, have actually been found all over our um, waterways, and they're um, thought to be causing a lot of problems. Another big concern with it is these perfluorinated materials are often found in firefighting foams and they're finding it um, in the blood samples of firefighters, which is never a good thing. You don't want to see artificial chemicals showing up in anyone's bloodstream. Um, so we're trying to eventually phase out a lot of these uh, fluorinated compounds because we know they're pretty bad for the environment and they persist for a long, long time. If you are thinking about buying pots and pans, what's a good alternative to Teflon pans? Cast iron's awesome. Cast iron's been around forever. If you season cast iron, it's nonstick. The tr trick is seasoning it well. Another good option is stainless steel pans. Yeah, stuff sticks to them, but you're not gonna get sick from stainless steel, um, and you don't have to worry about the environmental impact. Ceramic's, Ceramic's pretty good too. Ceramic's just not commonly used for stovetop um, because it can crack pretty easily. Yep. What about copper? I've seen copper. is pretty good too. Um, copper is just, you just usually a bit more expensive than stainless steel. So it kind of is depending on your price range. Cast iron's dirt cheap. You can buy a cast iron pan for $20 and you could probably give it to your grandkids when you die. So <laughs> it's a good way to go. All right, the next one is chloroethylene. So we've got a chlorine coming off one of the positions instead of a hydrogen. And if you look at this, you can see we've got a red monomer here. We've replaced one of the hydrogens with the chlorine. We've got a green monomer here, and we've replaced one of the hydrogens with the chlorine. So this is often referred to as vinyl chloride monomers. When you polymerize this, you get polyvinyl chloride, which is PVC. What's that used in? Pipes. So most of the pipes in your home are probably made of PVC, especially your um, sewer pipes are often made of PVC. The good thing with this is um, it's really, really, really cheap. It's easy to install. Um, old houses or reasonably new houses have copper pipes in them, but the price of copper is really high. Um, so people have been switching to PVC. All right, so that's one entire class of polymers. They're all addition polymers. The nice thing with these is they produce no waste. We have no byproducts from these reactions. So they're very efficient reactions. They produce bulk amount of product using relatively cheap starting materials. I haven't heard anything about the triple bonding broken apart to make into um, Yeah, so your question was about triple bonds. People have tried to polymerize triple bonds. They tend to be very unstable. Um, so it's more of this chemical oddity. Uh, addition polymers for the most part are between things containing double bonds. Yeah, so addition polymers tend to follow into this class. There's a bunch more. These are just some of the more common ones that I like to talk about because you run into them um, around your home and around your community. Yep? It's a good question. So it gets into radical chemistry, which we aren't even close to talking about. But you have to have a radical initiator. Um, often it's a peroxide, and it will basically start this uncontrollable reaction where things just link together. Um, and then it stops when you run out of monomer, if that makes sense. Yeah. Is there another question? Yeah, we're going to talk about the next, actually. Man, this is great. <laughs> so let's take a look at the other type of polymers. And again, I apologize. I was hoping to write these all out, but you're welcome to copy them down as needed. A condensation polymer is slightly different. 
It's a polymer that basically kicks off a byproduct in the reaction. So the byproduct can be water, it can be hydrochloric acid, it could be a bunch of different small molecules. It just means you're condensing something out during the course of the reaction. So a common condensation polymer would be using this alcohol called ethylene glycol on the left. You see how we've got an alcohol off the both left and right hand side. And then we've got terephthalic acid. This has a carboxylic acid coming off of each end of an aromatic or a benzene ring. And when you do this, you're going to react that carboxylic acid with an alcohol, and you're actually going to kick off a water unit. So I've circled the water unit that's going to be kicked off in red. And so you can see when you do this, you actually form a new ester linkage. And this could theoretically repeat on forever and forever. Uh, the reason this is called polyester is because of that ester linkage. And what's polyester found in? Clothes, right? So polyester is commonly found in clothes. Does anybody know why polyester is really cool in clothes? Doesn't wrinkle, exactly. <laughs> so if you are looking for no iron clothing, it's usually made of something like polyester or polypropylene because you don't need to iron them. In fact, if you do kind of get in a hurry and you're like, well, I'm going to iron it anyways, what's the problem with ironing polyester? You might melt it. <laughs> so you have to be really careful ironing some of your clothes. So on your problem of the day, I gave you an example of an addition monomer and then a set of uh, reagents to make a condensation polymer. It's following the same trend. So if you are kind of stuck, look at this polyethylene example and you can pull it up in OneNote as well if you don't want to take the time to write all of this down. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Sometimes with clothing, you don't see pure polyester simply because it's kind of uncomfortable. It feels weird wearing a plastic. Um, it doesn't feel good on your skin where cotton feels nice and soft. Um, so more and more shirts are being made of these blends where they actually interweave the fibers of cotton and the polymer together. The nice thing with that is you get the properties of both. So non-iron and soft. Um, so one of my favorite t-shirts are the tri-blend tees. Um, they're super soft. I'm not trying to advertise for them at all. Um, but I still have shirts from high school that are tri-blend tees and I wear them every week. Um, so they last forever. It's pretty cool. So Polyester is pretty neat in terms of uh, super durable clothing that you don't have to iron. It was very popular in the 70s. Um, so those were the ones that were pure polyester. It went out of fashion for a while because that's what people associated it with. But now, like I said, it's coming back as these blends with cotton and other polymers as well. All right, I do have one more addition polymer that I think is really cool. Or sorry, condensation polymer. Or actually two more, I think. This one is with phosgene. And like I said, you're welcome to write down the structures or just look at them from one note. But with phosgene, this is actually a gas that was used in World War I. And you can react this with bisphenol A, that's the same BPA that's found in your plastic water bottles, right? And when you do this, you can make a big long polymer called polycarbonate. What's that found in? Yeah, protective glasses. Oftentimes, uh, windows are coated in polycarbonate to make them shatterproof. So, for example, a lot of the shatterproof windows in office buildings have that polycarbonate clothing just to make it safe in case you do have a window break. Um, it's a pretty cool product, and it's produced on a massive scale industrially. Um, what do you think the byproduct is for this reaction? I kind of gave you a hint. Hydrochloric acid, right? So when we look at what's not included in the big polymer chain, the two atoms that aren't there are hydrogen and chlorine. So the byproduct of this reaction is HCl. So you can kick that off when you're done. All right, the last one's for people who serve in the military or in the police force. What you can do is you can take this amine, it's a nitrogen-containing compound, and react it with what's called an acid halide. And you can end up linking these together through a bunch of amide bonds, right? So I've got the amide bond circled in green. The nice thing with amides is they are really, 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 really strong, right? 
which is why our proteins are made of them. We don't want our proteins to fall apart super easily. We want them to stay together as long as possible. What's the byproduct here? HCL. HCL, just like before, the two atoms that weren't included in this is HCL. So this example would be Kevlar. It's a very strong polymer. It's used in bulletproof FES. The other cool application for Kevlar that I didn't know about till recently is in the International Space Station. They actually have the International Space Station wrapped in Kevlar. Does anybody know why? What's that? Aliens? <laughs> Keep the aliens out. Any other reasons? <laughs> Impacts, right? So if you're in the space station and a micrometeorite hits you going 20,000 miles an hour, that's never a good thing. Um, so what they do is they wrap the space station in Kevlar to protect from small impacts. So it's a really cool plastic. It's important um, for bulletproof vests and for uh, anything that might or, uh, be hit by a, a projectile. Yep? How, how does it absorb the impact of those or not? It's kind of interesting. So there's a few of you, I'm sure, that have worn Kevlar before. And if you've ever seen somebody who's been shot wearing a Kevlar vest, it does not protect them in the way you'd think. You will still break your ribs and have a massive hemorrhage wound, meaning a big bloody spot on your skin. However, that's still a big improvement over a bullet wound, right? So Kevlar, essentially what it does is it absorbs that impact and displaces it over a large surface area. The kinetic energy from that bullet is still going into you, which means you do not want to be shot still. Um, usually in the military, in addition to Kevlar, what they'll do is put in a thin, or a thin metal plate to help distribute that over an even larger surface area. And in fact, the military has been working on uh, more advanced body armor that's actually uh, non-Newtonian fluid. It's pretty dang cool. Uh, the way it works is a bulletproof vest is a liquid, so it's kind of like you're wearing this gel bulletproof vest, but when a bullet hits it, it immediately solidifies the entire thing. So it distributes it across your entire chest versus you know a three inch uh, diameter, which is not gonna feel good. Um, so pretty cool stuff. I do have a cool video. This blows me away. I'm not sure if it blows other people away, but this is a Kevlar test. I had no idea how strong Kevlar was, so we'll take a look at this. So to put that into perspective, that's the most powerful handgun in the world. It went through only five sheets of this polymer and wouldn't go through the sixth. So even with the most powerful handgun in the world, this will protect you. They also put this on the inside of vehicle doors, especially armored vehicles, because a bullet will clearly go through steel, but it won't go through the Kevlar, which is pretty crazy to think about, that it'll go through steel but not a plastic. Yep. Uh, that is a cool video, but they did get you just a little bit. They use a 357 Desert Eagle, which is a little better. Oh, yeah, that's not the 50 yeah, caliber yeah, one. But... <laughs> that's a little cheating on their counter. But... Yeah, it is a little bit weird to think about, but um, like it said at the end, most Kevlar vests have 16 sheets of Kevlar in it, which is plenty to uh, withstand an impact from most uh, bullets, with yeah. the exception of some armor piercing ones. So that's where we're going to end today. To kind of reiterate, because I know we went through this really quick, addition polymers always go from a double bond to a single bond. You don't kick off any byproducts. Condensation polymers, you link two things together, and then you kick off a small molecule. It's usually going to be some sort of acid or water. On an exam, it'll probably look a lot like the pod. I just want you to know how to link things together to form a polymer. I'm not going to ask you about names or anything like that.